Hi, everybody. Trust everybody's doing well. And uh, so, yeah, I just uh, wanted to, s what our main theme is going to be today is sort of clearing some of the, clear the air kind of on performance characterization and how you measure performance of big data processing platforms. There's so many frameworks out there. More come every day. And everybody's got a, you know, there's something in the code that they want to change. They want to tune the code to get better performance. But what I am is an, in, you know, an infrastructure guy. And I would like to see what kind of resources are being used by these processing frameworks to be able to do a lot of different things, actually. So the motivation is, you know, why do you want to do this? When in the process do you want to do this? And do you want to do this in the beginning of your life cycle of your project? Do you want to do it on an ongoing basis? So there's multiple applications, and there is no, like, there's no boundary like, oh, I have to do this at the beginning of my project, and then I, I can let go. So that's what I want to talk about, set the outline for the talk. Why, when, how, and in what, what places do you want to put these uh, characterization or frame characterization, uh, let's say, insights into, right? So, so again, like I said, there's a plethora of frameworks. Previous talks have covered so many different uh, frameworks. Hive, uh, you know, and underneath there's MapReduce paradigms. There's Tez, right? There's there's so many of them. So it's it becomes, at least for me, it becomes kind of difficult to navigate this whole landscape. Of what am I going to get when I put this thing into my dev? cluster, what does, what does it mean, what do I get when I get into a stage cluster, and what does it mean when I get into a production cluster, right? So to be able to characterize, to be able to predict, to be able to say, yes, this is what the bounds on my performance are going to be. This is how the system's going to scale in terms of what, what dimensions of resources, compute, network, storage, is it going to consume, right? So it's... Frequently, you know, what happens is uh, people will tell you that this particular benchmark is there and it, it will run, you know, the fastest terasort has been invented by this particular vendor or so-and-so, right? But what you need is really what your problem is, and you need to solve that problem, right, to characterize your own problem. You need tools for that in your in-house deployments, right? It has no bearing or, you know, whether somebody's uh, terasort runs faster or somebody's terasort runs slower, right? So it, it's really about you know, in-house. You want to plan a deployment. You want to choose the right hardware infrastructure, be it in the cloud, be it in a co-location center, or it could be your own data center, right? So we need to do capacity planning in our day-to-day -day operations, troubleshooting, performance tuning and scaling. So typically, people will say, OK, uh, let's run this benchmark, right? But what do you get out of running, on a, running a benchmark, right? That's important. So what we've done is we've chosen a couple of you know, well-known, just to make sure that we set the ground, you know, there's, there's some common ground, use some uh, well-known uh, algorithms, TerraSort for MapReduce, and the TPCDS benchmark for Hive and Tez on, for Hive on Tez and MapReduce, and then the Spark Perf from Databricks, to just so it's not how you actually um, measure. Uh, it's it's not you know how fast these things run, but what do you see when you run these uh, benchmarks, right? And you don't need to run huge data sets to be able to be able to see how these systems are consuming resources and how they are performing, right? And what the trend lines are. Okay, so any questions so far? If there, yes? What is TPCDS? 
It's a well-known uh, database uh, benchmark that vendors typically run their, you know, it's like queries being run on huge data sets. And people want to see, you know, typically somebody from Dell will say, you know, TPCDS, this benchmark, our machines, this particular hardware platform runs really fast, right? Using, you know, so we've set the records or something. It's, it's an industry consortium that you can, you can actually download this, all of these, and run them. So where do we run it? We, we've run it in, in AWS. So the methodology is identify key characteristics. And continuously, once you've identified those key metrics, key characteristics, you continuously measure and analyze. Right? That's the key portion. Uh, you know, you're continuously looking at data from different sources, not just from the uh, infrastructure, but also from you're looking at what uh, application history or application timeline servers are telling you from Hadoop. So you're getting information from mul multiple sources and trying to you know, fit, you know, uh, solve the puzzle, basically, where the problems are and if you're running into some issues and how to troubleshoot those issues faster, right? So what we've done is use TerraSort from Amazon as an illustration for this approach. We used a D2 extra large nodes with uh, two core nodes and one master node. And we ran, like I said, we, you don't need huge data sets or huge, large you know, uh, or big you know, clusters to actually do this characterization. That is the key, the, the thrust or the cut and thrust of this talk. So here's, here's something that I pull up like, one of the, the two dimensions was the CPU. How does CPU you know, what's the cost of CPU as the problem set size increases, right? Pretty linear, right? Uh, for memory and for CPU, it's linear. And the number of maps and reduces, this is uh, also linear. Uh, the reduces are constant because obviously you're partitioning data set, but the maps are linear. This, here's something interesting. The average reduce time, average shuffle time and time, total time taken. Everybody can see that? No? Oops. All right. The, the trend line is, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the trend, the key thing, so this captures, whatever we saw earlier was that there's linearity in everything else, right? The, the graphs are pretty linear. Now, but what happens is uh, as you increase the data set size and due to certain variations in AWS in the network performance due to the multi-tenant nature of AWS, you will see that the shuffle time, which is the time that nodes exchange data, tends to dominate the performance. And there, if the shuffle time results in non-linearity, then you will see that the non-linearity become, is, the shuffle time dominates, and so the, the, it translates to non-linearity in the running time of the algorithm. So this, that's, you know, so what do we do? We, we actually, as part of our study, what we do is we look at why this is happening, right? Why is this the case? So we have a continuous intelligence engine that is looking at all the data that's coming at, at us from these deployments, right? So here's something that we plotted, the shuffle characterization. Shuffle, the number of bytes for the shuffles are also linear, right? So remember, so everything is linear except the time taken, right? So why is that? Why is that happening? Here's what we plotted when we looked at the network performance, right? So the network performance for one of the nodes, which is pretty representative of all the nodes in this case, as you can see, we're up to uh, you know, 130,000 packets per second. Now, these are really small, so I'll skip over these here. And on another interface on the other in, uh, device, so we are almost getting to a point where we are reaching the theoretical maximum, not the theoretical maximum, the 
practical maximum in AWS for this kind of node, right? That's why you see the non-linearity, even though the number of bytes are move, bytes that are being moved between two nodes is, the, is linear in nature, but because the network is reaching the max performance, close to the max performance, so you're seeing the non-linearity in the time taken to transfer these bytes. So any questions, like that's, I've thrown a lot of, <laughs> so if, if there are any questions. So this is a D2X extra large instance in Amazon that has, Amazon will tell you it has moderate network throughput. They don't give you a number on it, right? So they will say this is moderate. What does moderate mean? So theoretical maximum on these nodes is one Gbps, one gigabit per second, right? But the moderate ones go from 200 to 500 megabits per second. So it could fall in that wide window and your application would start seeing this kind of non-linearity, right? So it's very important that you, know, you could run your tests at one point in time, time t, right, when you're planning your deployment, see its set of results. Then you move to time t plus x, right, and then you see a different uh, performance. That's why you need continuous intelligence or continuous uh, information being analyzed from these data sources, right? And I'll sh I can show you a, actually a demo, quick one here. This is our dashboard. It's implemented using Sumo Logic. So this is, this is for actually for Spark. Okay. It's a little slow here. <laughs> so when we ran, as you can see, when, when we ran some, okay, uh, gosh, again, it's a little too tiny, right? But the key is, you see these little jagged patterns. The, that's when the, there was, you know, the, prob, the, the algorithm was running. And I'll, I'll get back to this part as this is just an illustration. I'll get back to it. But what is key is, you see the amount of memory that, they, that these uh, frameworks uh, consume. It's like goes up to maximum, regardless of problem size. These frameworks will just go and grab every bit of memory they can while they're running. So it's like a greedy approach, right? They're trying to grab as much as they can to run the fastest that they can. You can obviously set these things. You can set them statically, but there's no way to set them dynamically, right? Where you are able to, say, con get data in, analyze, and set the memory patterns appropriately, right? memory usage patterns. Let me go back. And resume here. So that, that is enough said about, you know, map reduce and this is some of the trends that we saw while running TerraSort tests in terms of memory consumption. You can see how the memory went up, like way up there when these tests were running. And uh, the longer the memory stays up there, the more chances that your system will start, you know, choking literally. Like, it's thrashing. It's like somebody drowning, right? They're trying to flap, you know, their hands, trying to stay afloat. It's, it's seriously, what, that's what happens. And that will result in more CPU usage. As we go along, we'll see that. And these are some of the disk changes uh, that you, disk performance. So the key elements are storage, network, and compute, right? and how those uh, resources are being used by, the, by your system. And this is some, a sample of how HDFS, the underlying file system, is being used. So what we're saying is essentially, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to reproduce this kind of characterization without a lot of uh, expensive hardware, right? And get, get to know your application, get to know how it impacts your infrastructure a priori, rather than finding it out in production, right? So, I, like I mentioned, 
we ran all this in a one GBPS instance where the network, we, we established that the network was the, you know, was the choking point. Can I get 10x the performance? If I upgrade from one GBPS nodes to 10 GBPS nodes, can I get 10x the performance? What would be your best guess? No. And it costs you 10x, but it's not going to get you 10x performance. So what else do you get for that 10x investment in these resources? You get tons of RAM. You got, uh, so instead of, uh, you, you get tons of uh, CPUs, 244 vCPUs. And you get 48 terabytes of uh, disk. Sorry, and this is a typo, 244 gigabytes, not 24. Uh, D2XL comes with 30.1 gigabytes. <coughs> So what do you do with all of these resources, right? You've got, you went ahead and invested 10x. What else do you want to do? How do you want to you know, justify this? How would you justify this to your CIO, right? Or to your CFO who's cutting the check that I need this? Well, one way is if you have in your business different applications that have different needs, then you mix the jobs so that you utilize all of your resources to say at least 50%. I think 50% would be a good number to you know, start off with because there are obviously spikes you have. But you know, coming from the background I come from, like um, networking and infrastructure, typically people will aim for that kind of utilization. Although Google claims that they can do like 90% utilization on their network when they run their application. So, questions? Any? Yeah. yeah. So, given that we didn't get like a linear scale there, is there a recommendation here, especially if my application is, has a lot of terminals, to go smaller on the instance sizes and like have more of them? Um, mm -hmm. is, that, that, is that something that, like, I I, that Yeah, so one, correct. Yeah, that's a good question. So, one thing, to look for in the shuffles is obviously you don't want to be moving that much data around. If you can, in your application, can partition better, right? And then obviously, like you said, have more nodes that will, uh, the key part is that if you've partitioned well, you wouldn't need to have uh, that many move, uh, that many shuffles in your algorithm. So that, that was the key takeaway from this. The, the data has not been very well partitioned. So the faster terasorts that are out there have actually partitioned the data much better, right? So that's, does that get to your answer? Yeah, I mean, obviously you have to do that regardless of your instance. Correct, right? right. You want to optimize your application. Yes. After you do that, there's some cases where that's not avoidable. Yes. And now we want to try to optimize our cost and performance from that. Yes. Yeah, I, right. So one of the reasons that I chose that we chose D2 extra large is this is what Amazon you know, sort of recommends for your Hadoop install. So we were trying to go for what they tell you, and what does that get you, right? For that at that price point, there's always a cost performance trade-off, right? You can always go. Typically, what we've seen in deployments is people will have heavily over-provisioned clusters, heavily over-provisioned. CPU never goes above 2%, right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I find that a little jarring, you know, to, to you know, see that. And, uh, and I've had people complain that, you know, AWS costs a lot. It's not, it's not inexpensive. So I don't know what your guys' experience has been. Uh, whether that echoes with some of what you you have experienced or I think AWS is good to like get started as a prototype to build a good prototype for a company that is just starting up. Right. But as soon as you start growing you have start thinking of uh, your own data center or some other cloud vendors, especially because the ratio like uh, they always have to like double everything. Hmm. Yeah. 
Exactly. So you're paying for a lot of things that you don't actually need, unless you can find you know, that the. But what's the alternative here? Like, how am I going to build? Like, I mean, the only alternative is to build a custom machine. If my application is network bound, then I have to like you know scale up. Right. Network. So, yeah. It seems to be like a very tedious and probably even cost you more on the long run than just to say, I'm not going to utilize the CPU, I'm just going to get this like bigger node because I really need the network. So, one thing is that your business might have a heterogeneous job mix that you want to schedule intelligently, right? So, be, to be able to utilize. The other thing is looking at converged infrastructure where all the units, the network, the storage, and the compute are all in one box sitting in, say, a four-rack unit a footprint, right? They show better performance in, the, in these cases. The reason we chose this is because we see a lot of our customers using AWS and, you know, it, it's, it's uh, but they complain about the cost and the cost performance trade-off. So. so we looked at the, you know, map reduce uh, paradigm, and then query-based systems or query-based frameworks are also, you know, so popular. There's, there's and everybody, even the NoSQL guys, have a query-based front end, right? Because you have so many legacy applications out there that you want to move uh, to a you know, uh, big data processing, uh, but but you still want the the look and feel of the query-based system. So we use TPCDS, and we wrote, you wrote our own queries. We use both MapReduce and TES as our underlying processing engines or frameworks. And the table sizes were not huge, just two, 10, 50 GB with one, two, three joins. These are the sample queries. So this, this is all very, you know, I'll skip over these because the interesting portions are a little bit later here. These are all the number of maps and reduces with different joins. Oops. Yeah, so, oops, buffered keystrokes. Okay, so these are the operations. Hold on, yeah. So these are the running times, uh, and we'll see. We'll see that how the three join running time actually it never even you know there was so much thrashing going on that the system just couldn't do it. This is a 50 GB table with three joins with a limit set on the queries to just 100 rows, right? It didn't run with this hardware, which is uh, it has 30 gigs of RAM on each node, right? And there is uh, 1.2 terabytes of hard disk on each one of them. And now we'll see how and why. And so uh, these are the maps and reduces. This is the memory consumed. Uh, the trend is important. You can see that the memory is with, I have a trend line there which shows that it's linear. But the time taken is super linear, again. So here's a 10 GB problem, and you have a sup, uh, linear, almost linear in memory consumed, but super linear in time taken, right? Why does this happen? So we can go into the back to our demo. Uh, and see why that, oops, don't die on me. Yeah, there we go. Second, it's a little slow. Network, come on. Okay. <laughs> I 
<laughs> All right. So, as you can see, while the job was running, or as you cannot see, <laughs> can you see the CPU over there? <laughs> so, the CPU basically, when the jobs were running, the CPU was going up and uh, the idle time goes down. That's when the, the most of the number crunching is happening. And the key thing is, why is the CPU getting busier, right? We're not like really exercising the CPU, right? But if you see here, the memory is going way up high. This is 50 GB, right? And that results in CPU doing, swapping, trying to swap pages in and out, right? And so your CPU starts going up. So what's really happening is these frameworks, they're going and trying to grab as much memory as they can. Right. That's something that needs to be controlled. And you cannot, I mean, there, you know, it's not a cooperative system anymore when somebody tries to grab everything they can, right? It's not, it's not nice. So that is a recurring theme. You see that, where do you see the non-linearity? You know, you, you've seen every, every operation, every, uh, the number of data bytes or the problem set is linear, but then there are certain uh, points when non-linearity happens, right? And so we're trying to find the cause of that non-linearity. And each application might be different. And you might have a mix of applications. So it, it can get, you know, it's a pretty complex, but at the same time, it's, it's a fun thing to solve, right? So if we go back to my presentation. Oops. Any questions now while, while this loads up or we have 10 more minutes? Because lunch is at 12.20. Oh, I don't want to keep people from their lunch. I might get <laughs> stuff thrown at me. <laughs> <laughs> so while this is loading, we can you know, have some time for some questions. Uh, yeah, please. So, so come to this session, I was expecting to see uh, how your instruments is pipeline with monitoring. But so far, I've seen you see some, some themselves, but it's a memory in the Right. Assumption, all that stuff. Right. But it's supposed to be building a, a pipeline. Yes, yes. Monitoring. Yes. What tools and what infrastructure I do? I, I haven't heard that much. OK, OK, yeah, good, good point. I haven't. So. Our idea is basically we have agents sitting in all of these nodes, right? And we are getting data from the REST APIs that uh, all of these uh, data processing engines uh, expose. So Hadoop timelines, application timeline server, uh, sorry, Yarn ti timeline server, Hadoop uh, job history server, right? All of these frameworks. These are just examples. You can get it from Ganglia. You can get it from any of these sources and you can throw it in to this analysis engine. And that analysis engine has the intelligence to be able to figure out what's happening in your system. So it's disparate data sources, right? You, you can, anytime you go into Amazon, right, AWS, you'll have CloudWatch turned on, Ganglia turned on. But what really happens is that these are being looked at by different people, right, a lot of times. That's been my experience. Uh, the NetOps guys, the SysOps guys, the DevOps guys, they're all looking at different things at different times. They're not looking at the same thing. Uh, there's not a single pane of visibility into your infrastructure as well as the application and to connect the dots between the two. So suppose you have five coming in, mm -hmm. I, all the information you mentioned about the system, but it's not really a job level. Oh, job level too. You can get job level information. And we, we are using job level information from Hadoop. How the, how the mappers and how yeah, yeah, yeah. How the mappers are progressing, how the reducers, everything. And we have integrated that. So shameless plug, we have done this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not comparable to the software. I 
<laughs> I'm not a, I guess I'm not the marketing guy for my company. <laughs> Right. Uh, what we do is continuously look at all the data, and we have built up with our customers a job bank, pretty much. And we are trying to build a system that will actually be able to predict performance, right, based on your uh, applications and the right training data being supplied to that. Application. I can show you uh, la uh, later. I can show you the architecture diagrams that we have. That is our presentation, you know, sort of from our company perspective. I didn't want to encumber this uh, room with that, you know, uh, basically uh, not to trying to pitch that. But I'll show it to you. So uh, I'll just quickly then uh, go through the Spark tests, and this seems to the Spark test that we ran. What's happening? It's not right. Come on. Might have to revert to the one that I have stored. Okay, here we go. So again, Spark, uh, in summary, the Spark tests are also dominated by a similar theme, except the network again plays a huge part. And so again, the, this, the Spark Perf tests come from Databricks, from their GitHub repository. Their SQL tests are not running right now, not compiling. So we couldn't run those. But we ran the Spark and the Spark streaming tests. Um, so again, if CPU is not utilized, memory keeps going up, but it doesn't sustain at such a high level such that it's a problem. And Disk also, it's fine. The network is what really, you know, is, so if you see the network, uh, that's where the crux of the problem is again, because you're reaching a maximum of what your peak throughput will be on the network for the Spark cluster. So if only I could get this back up, but no. So I will, uh, then I can show you the, uh, so the, yeah, God, sorry, uh, it's not showing up, but I can show you the architecture uh, of our, you know, what, what the system that we use. And if there are any more questions, let me know. No, it, it, so it's an automated, you know, uh, process where once, uh, okay, so there's, there's one aspect which is the modeling aspect, right? The modeling of your application and there, if you have tools for those, right? Sure. Yeah, so that you can say even at the data modeling phase, a lot of people are spending a lot of time, a lot of cycles at the data modeling phase and they don't know what the impact of that data modeling phase is going to be when you run that application, right? So we're trying to bridge that gap too, so that you can actually predict without actually running your application how to get to that point, right? And dropping resources, yes, when you, so you can change the type of storage on your 
devices for that. So if I can, I can use HDD, suppose my budget is such that I can only afford HDD, or I have a legacy system that used to have HDD, I want to repurpose it for my you know, lower end jobs, yeah. right? You use HDD, but if you want a higher performing application, you could use SSD. So you can plug in an SSD and see the test, the impact of that. And this is without you actually running your application. So, is that? I mean, it, it is. It's, hmm. That's interesting. I think what I was getting at more is, so you see that you're, you're pinning your network. Yes. Right? So I want to then test, well, if I just swap in a bunch of containers with half as much CPU, am I still pinning my network? If I then swap in all HDD boxes, am I still pinning my network? Right? How much can I throw away at this point? Yeah. Right. Because, you know, okay, the network's pinned. Correct. Cool. There's going to be another bottleneck. There's going to be something where I can toss out a huge amount of resource with no effective consequence. Um, and so that's what I was wondering if that's manual or if that's automated. Like, is there an iterative test where it goes, okay, this is bottleneck, drop everything else. Oh, this, you know, where you find new bottlenecks and you kind of, mm -hmm. you know, right, you right. Your under damp system to, to converge on something where your bottlenecks are close. Yes. So that's a good question. So one of the things that, uh, uh, that, would, that is interesting there is how today's systems do all of this statically. That's why you have to do an iterative process, right? Memory consumption, Spark, Spark executor, for example, how much memory will it take? So our approach is slightly different from that approach, right? We want to do it dynamically. And we want to be able to, so that's where we are going towards, okay. where you dynamically change things. So you don't have to run one test and then scale down in one resource and see the next. So you're going to see the impact of the dynamically resizing of your cluster. I guess I'm willing to pay the cost to statically resize things as long as I don't have to have a human in the loop to iterate. That's, uh, yeah, that's, Before I'm right. yeah, we should talk. Okay. Okay. No, no, no worries. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks for a great, great audience. Thank you, guys. You make it better.